Hey, this is Tyler with TJX Survival. I'm here with Dave Westcott, and we are going to talk about knives as they apply to survival. So stay tuned. Okay, guys, so I'm here with Dave Westcott, and I know who he is, but you may not know who he is. Um, so I'm going to have him talk a little bit about his history and his past and his experience when it's in relevance to knives. And we're going to have a little discussion with the puppy, <laughs> have a little discussion about knives, some of the attributes that they have, and uh, some things that you should, you should be looking for. Okay. Well, I'm Dave Westcott. I've uh, been involved in the primitive skills field for about 45 years. I started in the 70s with uh, Larry Olson, uh, running primitive survival courses in the deserts of southern Utah. Uh, did that for a number of years. Went from there to uh, owning Boulder Outdoor Survival School. Uh, for uh, uh, quite a while and, um, and then when we sold that we started a company called Backtracks uh, that we operate to this day and uh, so we're focusing on keeping traditional skills alive uh, trying to use the primitive skills as a foundation for uh, building on uh, the more modern skills that people are using in the outdoors today. So one of the things that I talk about on a pretty regular basis are some of the design characteristics you should look for in knives. I always argue that the the ancient people have had hundreds and thousands of years to perfect their designs. And even though I say that, I, I don't like seeing new designs usually on a regular basis, but I do like to see new technology. Meaning when you've got a higher quality steel that you can put into a knife, you can create a more, uh, a stronger handle to steel connection and all the new technology can be applied in a great way in that fashion. But when we go creating knives that are just they, they do like 87 different things and not one thing well. That's where we kind of go off the path and try to reinvent the wheel. So. It's a, yeah, a lot of them are neat gimmicks, but they don't, they're not functional. They sell well, yeah. but they don't work very good in the field. And I know that's a big problem I see online quite often is people are constantly trying to get some good advice from people who have actually been in the field for a number of years and used everything from a piece of flint to a kitchen knife to do some skinning. It'd be good to get feedback from people like that. They all work, but some things work a little bit better than others. Yeah, I mean, they were designed in the field. They were designed for a specific purpose in a specific location. So when you see a design that's different than any other design, and you take that design out of its context, then what have you got? You've yeah. got a neat looking tool that may or may not work for you in the new environment that you're in. And so when I was coming up, one of the things I found out was that when I started looking back at how I developed my skills, when I started out with Larry Olson, the knife of choice was a Barlow knife. So everybody had a Barlow pocket knife, and you got a knife that's been so around. Those old, old folding ones, yeah. or did it look like one of these? No, a little folder, a little pocket oh, okay, knife, yeah. Barlow. So that's around, a little bit before my time. Been around <laughs> since George Washington's day. Yeah. You know, so that was the knife of choice. That's what you did all of your, your, your field skills with. That's what you started your flint and steel fires with. I had a Barlow that was so beat up you couldn't even open it anymore. Yeah. We had started so many flint and steel fires with it. So that was the knife of choice. Uh, how it ended up being that way, it was just something that came out of Larry's history. And so you develop your skill set around that particular knife. And then from there, I think I went to an Uncle Henry folding lock back, and then I had another Uncle Henry sheath knife. And those were the knives that I taught skills with for probably, uh, probably 10 years. Uh, and they were good enough because of the fact that my skill set was developed around even a more primitive uh, tool, which was probably something more like more along the lines of this. I mean, I came up in the 50s, and uh, you know, uh, K bars and, and marbles knives were still on the market, and these westerns like this that had a that had a very narrow blade, uh, fairly flexible. Yeah. As a result, you develop a skill set that allows you to work with that tool. So you're yeah. choking up all the time. You're doing things that allow you to do lots of uh, variety of skills with a non-folding knife, but still get the job done. And the fact that it has some flex built into it, you. The finesse with which you work a tool is different than, the, than if somebody handed me a modern tool, which yeah, is much, like much more rigid and much more thick. Thicker blade like this guy mm -hmm. there. Yeah. yeah, see, I can hardly, you know, if you hand me that, the tendency is to say, what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. Or if I start working with that knife, it looks like I don't know what I'm doing because my skill set isn't designed around a tool like this. Exactly. I mean, I'm working up in here as opposed to working back in here. And so, even if you were to hand this to somebody whose, whose skill set was built around a a kitchen knife, you know, for somebody who goes out and catches fish every day and sharpens their knife on a rock and that thing is worn down to a nub. Yeah, it's um, going to be more thick and a little bit harder to fillet yeah, with. Yeah, how are they going to do anything with that? 
you know. So once again, that's probably good for the purpose of this design. But you got when you say one size fits all, it no, doesn't. it doesn't. No, there, yeah, I, I, that's one thing I want to beat really solidly. There is no one knife for everybody. I like to teach people the characteristics and what what the values of those characteristics are, so that they can make an informed decision for themselves. This guy, these guys right here, these are knives that I grew up with. My grandfather from the 50s, and in fact, that knife was designed to compete against the K-Bar in you're, World you're War II. You're dating me now. <laughs> Your grandpa. My grandpa's older, older than this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> so this, this right here has skinned multiple deer. I can't even, I don't even, since it's older than me by a generation at least, it has skinned so many deer, I can't tell you. It did skin a Boone and Crockett deer in the 1950s, which is kind of cool. But that was its purpose. It has that sway back here. Um, you can pull high and gut with it really well. It's a thin knife. And because of that, I, growing up, looked at a thin spring steel knife as the ultimate knife until I had to use other knives because I didn't have them as options. And then accordingly, I had to gain the skill set for each knife type. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about knife size. A uh, thank you. A large knife like this, you can do all the same skills that you can do with a small knife. Um, the only addition is it's a little easier to chop with, but it requires education that's different because you're not going to use this the same way you would a small knife because it's just bigger. Right. I've been in places with the world that that is their knife of choice, and so as a result, you're you're not only <coughs> hacking big things, which you know, that's designed to do. I mean, the mass of that blade alone uh, is going to work your arm. But, you know, to do the job that it's designed to do, it's, it's perfect. But you, then you've got a group of people who would, who would take that and say, okay, that's so much more superior than, to, than the, the simple tool that I've got. Just be, I mean... Superior is relevant to location. Yeah, that that and the technology. I mean, it's just like, uh, you know, if you take somebody and you walked into their camp and they're they're doing this kind of tool. That's great, you know, because that's the, how they've developed their their uh, lifestyle is around simple Stone Age technology. But then you hand them something like this, and it's just like going to be, well, I don't need this anymore. Yeah, you know, because this is so much better. Um, but is it? And the reason why I say that is to be honest with you, I would rather skin rabbits with that piece of flint than oh, I no would question. with this knife. Yeah. It's smaller easier to control, it separates the skin easier instead of cutting or ripping. There's just all these reasons why that for its purpose is superior than this. But if I'm gonna take a deer down, yes I can use this, but I'd rather use the blade because as a child, I went through so many deer with that specific knife right there. Yeah. And, and even primitive cultures, newer is better. You know, so they're gonna glom onto the newer technology. Yeah. But a lot of the times they're gonna finally figure out that okay, this is nice, but yeah, let's go back to this old stuff and uh, it probably does, it probably is more efficient in the long run. Yeah. The problem with it is though, is that as a culture, once you adopt this, and if you adopt this long enough, that this technology goes away. Exactly. As a result, the people who now are using this technology they can't become go dependent. back to this technology because they don't, they don't know it anymore. Yeah. And that's exactly where we are as a culture, is that we've lost this connection to the past. And so as a result, we're always playing this one-upsmanship, this newer is better, newer is better, newer is better, and then as a result, we forget our past technologies and we can't go back to them and replicate them. Yeah. Or we have to go back and we have to relearn them. And when you relearn them, then you relearn them in a new context. You don't learn the subtleties of how things were done in those days. And you lose a lot in the, in the process. And so that's what we do in our company is we try to make sure that people understand that, okay, this is nice, but if you understand this stuff, then this is so much better. It's so much easier. Yeah, I, I, that's a perfect correlation. I, I talk about fire a lot with the stuff that I teach. Um, and I, the, the one thing I come back to is if you can make a fire with a hand drill or a bow drill, making a fire with a Bic actually stays. Meaning I watch Boy Scouts, they're the worst. <laughs> I watch Boy Scouts with the lighter and they get green twigs and they hold the lighter till they get a flame, then it goes out and they get frustrated. It's because they don't understand convection heating, they don't understand the process of the coal drying out the fuel ahead of it. And uh, once you teach them that process, once you teach them about the fire triangle and show them how this coal dries out this nest, which dries out that tinder and kindling, which dries this out and makes that log start up. Once they get that chain of process and they add the oxygen to it, their fires are constant. Give them a bick and now it's really easy. But I believe if you take away that, what I'm gonna call the analog way of doing things and go straight to digital, you've deprived them of knowledge.
talking about all this, each thing is going to have a positive versus a negative. And as an example, a little chip of obsidian is going to be very positive to process small game. It's little, it's easy to control, it's incredibly ridiculously sharp. Um, a larger knife is going to be good here in the, the west to process brush for fire. Um, oftentimes I see a lot of videos that are in a woodcraft type area like the boreal forest type area. They have axes because they have trees. We have trees out here but not on the scale that they do back there so the majority of what we're going to be burning is deadfall and uh, I'd rather burn that in half than I would chop it or hit it with an axe or anything. So um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the characteristics that each knife has, what you want to look for, and it's going to be based upon where you're at in the world. So where are some places that you've traveled? Well, we've run courses all over the United States. We've done run courses in Mexico and, and been on the Sea of Cortez with, with Seri natives out fishing and processing food and spending weeks at a time in the deserts uh, along the coast. We've done, done courses in the Arctic with uh, Inuit people, uh, honey caribou and seal. So, you know, I've seen lots of people who live on the land use a knife, and it's really amazing how they can take a knife and use it and use it and use it and use it and virtually wear it down to enough yeah. uh, to where uh, until they can ultimately a tool. Yeah, until they can access and you know new something which is hard for them to do, they're gonna they're gonna make the best with what they've got. And that's that's goes back to that question that people always ask, you know, well what's if you only had one cut knife that you could take with you in the field, what would it be? Well, my answer's always been whatever it is I have to have in hand. Yeah. If I'm, you, I'm gonna grab it and use it, I don't care what who, what brand it is or anything else. If it's a cutting edge, it's a cutting edge. Yeah. So it's once you have the skill down. set, the knife doesn't matter. But also, it's a little easier with some things than it is with others. Yeah, yeah, there's tools to make the job uh, easier, no question about it. Uh, the other thing too is that you know when you start out with a skill set, you develop your you develop your technique around that knife. So if I've got a thin flexible blade like this, then that's how I'm gonna work it. The other thing too is that that, that question, go back, going back to that question, if you only had one knife. I've been doing this for 45, going on 50 years now. I, I, can, I can count on one hand the amount of times that I've been in the field with just one knife. Yeah. So that if you're going to be if you're going to be with one knife, isn't a isn't a really even a question for me. It, it rarely. I was I was a pocket knife kid. Yeah. So I grew up with a pocket knife in my pocket every single day. If going to school, it wasn't a weapon; it was a tool. So it was allowed. And I actually did the same thing until high school. Right. <laughs> and the transition happened. <laughs> But that idea that the pocket knife was always in my pocket, and that's one thing I think we need to get back to as well as people who spend time in the field is, is we get so caught up in fixed blade knives that we've virtu we have virtually forgotten the pocket knife. Exactly. And and you know we some people say well it's, you know, it's training wheels you got all these multi tool stuff and then you know, we got caught up in this in the, in the Swiss Army knives and that sort of thing. But just a simple stockman, you know, a little two blade knife can do so much for you. It fits in your pocket well, easy to carry. Um, but we need to get back to that. We need to go back and say, okay, this, these are viable tools. Absolutely. And they have a, they have a place in our in our kit. And, and yeah, they, these are these are nice and they do the big work. But those but those pocket knives are critical. Yep. Especially need... from a legal perspective. Oh, yeah. You guys in California, you can't carry a fixed blade, but you can carry a pocket knife. Right. A DPX Hess that I carry every single day is a folding pocket knife. I have a lock so I can lock it out and abuse it a little bit, but it is a folding pocket knife. I can start fires with it, I can treat it like any other survival knife, but I can carry it legally in California. Not in California, fortunately, but it's an example. And I think that's one of the reasons the Boy Scouts banned fixed blade knives for a while. You had, you had to use a pocket knife. Yeah. A lot of it was just because of the fact that they're an international or they're a national organization, so they had to be able to create policies that cross the That fit lines. everyone. You know. But anyway, when you move from something like this to something the, the more traditional or the more modern bend, you know, I'm going to jump. I, I jumped because of my training with Morris. You know, I jumped immediately into the Swedish knives. So yeah. The other this thing, is the Swedish and Norwegian. Another thing cool too is they're, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, true. Um, they're lighter weight. That's the big thing for me. I don't like packing a lot of heavy right. gear. That's one of the lightest weight, weight knives. I, and this one right here, this is a Puko from Finland. It's just super, super lightweight. So when you see some of the modern boat anchors that are out there. You put that around <laughs> your neck, you're gonna have. A, Next yeah, you can, you just can't neck carry yeah. a lot of that stuff. That's that was the next thing I moved over to was the, was the Scandinavian style knife. So um, you're right. The fact that it's light, it still has a little bit of flex to it. It's not quite so so long. That the design of the blade on this this is this was my when I when I switched from pocket knife use to, to fixed blade knife use. This is the one I went to. Um, and now you've got the the spin off from this to, to the more uh, 
uh, modern, all of the all whistles and bells, but this one, you know, if I look at all of these that are in the ground, this is the one I'm going to go to because it still yeah. has that same profile. It's closest to the original stuff still that you learned. Still has a good feel, still has a relatively thin blade. That's much thicker than I like, but that's yeah. kind of where we're going. Well, yeah, and it, it is actually thinner compared to most. Oh, yeah. This is the uh, Bark River Bushcrafter. This is the American Knife Company Forest Knife. And it's hard to see, but this one is actually a little bit thinner. And they both have attributes that are that are positive. Um, I use this one almost the most. And th this is designed uh, similar to the Skugan Bush tool, which was uh, essentially Morse Kochans Kohansky, if I say his name right, put together a list of attributes that a knife should have, and this was the result of that design. Yeah, I spent years with Morse. He used to run a lot of our memorial courses. So when we were running courses, with Bob, we, would, we did a course up there one year, a seventh day course. It was 55 below the entire time we were there. 55? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, 55 below the entire time we were there. So um, you're talking about courses uh, that uh, were Insane testing tools all the time. Cold. Yeah. Insane cold. And so these knives were doing just fine. We didn't. Have, I mean, and then you know, once again, if you're in the outdoors, uh, use the right tool for the right job. Once we switch from this and we get into big wood, then we're talking about axes. We're not yeah. talking about, but, you know. And we're me, not talking about a knife like this either. Yeah. Once again, you're talking. This a is great context. in the desert, but this is not what I would be bringing to a boreal forest. Yeah. Maybe to the Arctic. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about probably the person who popularized batoning in the art vernacular more than anybody is probably Morris. Uh, but, and the idea that you're using a knife in a pinch to do a job that an axe should do. Uh, but if you're in the field and you've th thought things through properly and you're prepared, you've got an axe with you that's going to do that heavy work of splitting logs and taking down trees and that kind of stuff. So you're not always having to improvise and do do jobs that a, a, mark, a, a knife wasn't designed to do. Exactly. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. But having the skill just in case is valid as well. Right. So obviously this all comes back to the skill set. You can use any knife to get the job done if you have the right skill set. So I want to throw a plug for his company. It's some place that is from my native state and some place that you can, if you're in the, the west and you want to check out, where can where can people go to learn about this? Well, we host a, a gathering that was the first primitive skills conference offered in the country. There's, a, there's 30 of them offered nationwide now, or and they're growing. Um, but Rabbit Stick is, is the oldest uh, primitive skills conference in the, in the country, and it's coming up in September. It's always held the third week of September. And we bring in uh, 90 of the top, the top instructors from across the country and around the world. And there's about 30 classes a day going on. So to be able to touch base with people uh, from a variety of different backgrounds and environments and to see how they teach and how they operate, it's an opportunity to Just second, a opportunity to second to that. Yeah, it's a convention essentially of people. Um, who are some people that these guys would know? Well, last year we had Alan, Alan May and um, uh, the second runner-up for alone last year. It was Alan Alan Key, right? Yeah, yeah, Alan Key and. Um, okay, there we go. Alan Sorry, Key. slaughtered him. My bad, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> and oh shoot, his name just slips me. So it's people from alone. Yeah, people from alone. Yeah. People from do, uh, dual survival. Dude, you're screwed. Uh, so uh, Matt Graham, yeah, Cody Matt, Lundin. Yeah, I'm doing the new introduction. Matt's re issuing his book, so I'm doing the new introduction for his book. Oh, uh, speaking Lundin. of books. Cody Lundin, who's been teaching for us. Well, I've known him since he was 20 years old, so he's teaching for he's been teaching for us ever since. So he's there every year. Um, it's just a, it's a who's who yeah. of people in primitive skills. Pretty much if you watch the survival show, there's a high probability someone will be there. Hazen Adele from the History Channel. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kat Bigney, who is on the human race, she's top for us, so yeah. Yeah, so essentially this is where all these people are getting these educational debates from. And obviously I'm a big, huge fan of skills. So I want to throw a plug too for his book, right there, Camping in the Old Style. Um, I will leave a link down below here where you can check that out. I'll leave a link where you can check out Backtracks. I'll leave information in the bottom, and if you have any questions, let us know. Thank you for coming in and talking to me today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, hit the subscribe button, throw some questions down below, and I'll be going there this year, so we'll have some footage. If you can meet me there, that'd be outstanding. Is it, I think it was the 11th, does that 11th, sound right? 17th of September. 11th, of, 11th through 17th of September. Registrations by... are open right now at uh, btprimitives.com or, or uh, backtracks.net. Uh, the other thing too is we're going to do a special open house the Saturday before on the 10th where we'll do a meet and greet with a lot of these people that are coming in. It'd be a good shows. time to sit down and chat with them all. Okay. So, and that's, uh, is that by Rigby? Rexburg. Idaho. Rexburg. Just outside okay. of Rexburg, Idaho. Just outside of Rexburg, Idaho. Um, all right. Leave your comments down below.
and thank you for watching TJAC Survival.